I grew up in a working-class family where my parents put in long hours to provide for me and my older sister, Anita. Even though we faced financial difficulties, the strength of our close family ties and love was clear, and people often admired our connection. We were regulars at church and always supported each other, even during disagreements. Anita left State College after a year to marry Darren Efland, her ideal partner who had a good job and volunteered as a firefighter. We got along well, and with some leftover college funds, I spent four years at State College, earning a degree in occupational therapy. I found a rewarding position at New Directions Incorporated, where I help people regain their mobility. Throughout college, I was in a relationship with my high school sweetheart, Chelsea Higgins, whom I met at church. I helped her evolve from a shy girl into a confident and elegant woman, and eventually, we married. We built a joyful life together with our three children, Amber, age 6, Rhonda, age 3, and Neil, age 4. We recently moved into a $950,000 house in a welcoming neighborhood with excellent schools, living out the all-American family ideal. As I arrived home, Rachel greeted me with a playful surprise and I joked about how punctual I was despite leaving Chelsea every morning. Rachel defended her cat, Tabby as a faithful companion and then mentioned that today's schedule was packed with four appointments. She seemed intrigued by how I managed to be at a movie premiere in California yesterday and back in North Carolina this morning. I was confused by her question and dismissed the idea, thinking it might be an April Fool's prank. Rachel insisted she saw me on TV at a premiere for a film called Candlelight Virgil, where I was introduced as Pierre Dumel with a fake French accent. I laughed it off, suggesting the actor might be my doppelganger, and decided to investigate. During my lunch break, I watched the movie and saw an actor who looked remarkably like me, almost like seeing my reflection, though he had a slight mustache and was European, unlike me. Later that night, I showed Chelsea what I found, and she was intrigued. She suggested contacting the actor Pierre Dumont to explore any connection. I dismissed it as coincidence but Chelsea was adamant about his unique personality and potential connection. Three weeks later, Chelsea excitedly informed me that Pierre wanted to meet me. She had sent him a picture of me in a suit from her cousin's wedding, and he was curious about our resemblance. I was taken aback by Chelsea's decision to contact him without asking me first and expressed concern about how it might affect my parents. Chelsea argued that meeting Pierre could be an exciting opportunity but I was firm that I didn't want to do anything that might hurt or embarrass my parents. Despite her insistence, I decided to talk to my parents first before making any decisions. Chelsea, understanding my loyalty to my parents, suggested showing them Pierre's picture and explaining the resemblance. The next evening, I visited my parents to discuss the situation. They revealed that I was adopted due to my mother's inability to conceive. They had adopted my sister first and then had the chance to adopt me under a tight deadline. They had no information about my biological parents other than that I was to be named Paul and carry their last name. They had always intended to tell me but chose not to out of concern for how it might affect me. I was overwhelmed by their love and support and thanked them deeply. Chelsea was relieved when I agreed to meet Pierre Dumont to explore our connection. At the Excel Hotel, a security guard, after a metal detector check, expressed surprise at my resemblance to Pierre. We proceeded to the presidential suite, where we were about to meet him. When Pierre and I first met, we were both stunned by how identical we were, same features, height, and weight. We both had webbed toes between the same two toes and identical fingerprints. We even wrinkled our brows and smiled with the same dimple. Chelsea was amazed by the resemblance. I introduced myself to Pierre, who revealed that he was also adopted and was investigating our shared past. He suggested we both submit DNA samples to confirm our suspicions. Pierre introduced Helena Moreno, his assistant, who was strikingly attractive and seemed to notice my interest. I greeted her, and she responded with a polite smile. Pierre then invited us to dinner at the Accela restaurant. The dinner was exquisite, and the waiter service was impeccable, reflecting Pierre's usual treatment. We discussed our similarities and agreed to wait for the DNA results before drawing any conclusions. 
Helena listened intently as Pierre and I compare our habits and behaviors. Chelsea was excited about the possibility of a familial connection and was enthusiastic about Pierre's career, which pleased him. Three days later, the DNA test confirmed that Pierre and I are identical twins, a rare result. Chelsea was thrilled. When I got home that night, she was excited about the prospect of having a wealthy brother who is a well-known star in Europe and is now trying to break into Hollywood. She told me Pierre had called and wanted me by his side for his press announcement. Helena had arranged first-class tickets for us to fly to California on Saturday for the press conference, with a limo waiting at the airport. I was more focused on our personal connection rather than the celebrity spectacle. I wanted to understand why we were separated at birth, why our records were sealed, and how Pierre ended up in France while I stayed in the U.S. I was concerned about the potential for media intrusion and how it might affect our family. Chelsea hadn't considered these issues and was eager to embrace the excitement. Despite my concerns, I reassured her that my focus was on building a meaningful relationship with Pierre and protecting our family from any unwanted attention. We agreed to enjoy the experience while keeping our priorities in check. Chelsea was more excited than I'd ever seen her. The limo took us to Pierre's luxurious hotel, where we shared an emotional hug. As confirmed identical twins, Pierre was moved by the recent discovery of each other's existence, and we both agreed to investigate our adoptions further. Despite sealed records, Pierre's contacts could help us find answers, and he assured me he'd handle the cost. I confirmed that my parents had no objections to learning more about our past and that my love for them remained unchanged. Pierre invited us to freshen up and then join him for a night out at the club. Helena, looking striking in a tight red dress, met us. She offered me her arm while Pierre escorted Chelsea to our table. Chelsea seemed fascinated with Pierre, laughing and dancing with him, while I danced twice with Helena, who interacted mainly with Pierre and showed little interest in me, possibly due to her apparent superiority. Chelsea was thrilled by the glamorous lifestyle and fully embraced the night out. While I found the scene unappealing. As we prepared for bed, I shook Helena's hand and thanked her. Pierre kissed Chelsea on both cheeks and on the lips, which Chelsea explained was a French custom. I found it odd that he didn't kiss either Helena or me. Chelsea's excitement extended into our bedroom, leading to an intense and enjoyable night for both of us. We slept deeply after our exhausting session. The next day, we traveled with Pierre, Helena, and his bodyguard Gerald to the press conference. Pierre made a spectacle of our reunion as long-lost brothers, with Chelsea and me by his side and Helena next to me. I was uncomfortable with the barrage of personal questions and felt unprepared. Pierre nudged me to the microphone to answer questions, but I simply stated that I wasn't ready to make any statements and stepped back. It seemed Pierre's plan was to use my presence to boost his career. Chelsea appeared frustrated with my response, while Pierre quickly took over and asked Chelsea to share her story. She embraced the spotlight, engaging with the reporters as they snapped photos. As Pierre and Chelsea engaged with the crowd, Helena whispered to me, asking what was wrong. I explained that while I was Paul Baylock and not Pierre Dumont, and although we looked alike, our personalities were very different. The media circus was not my scene. Helena seemed surprised and questioned why I didn't crave the attention. I explained that I was raised to be confident in who I am and didn't need the glitz and glamour. After the event, Gerald took us away from the chaos. I told Pierre that while I had attended the press conference and posed for countless photos, I was unprepared for the speech, which was his responsibility. Chelsea had stepped in to handle the situation effectively. Pierre reminded us of the time and rushed us to the airport. He mentioned that he would stay with us the following week to get to know me better, using the spare bedroom. He assured me that Gerald and Helena would stay nearby at the Excelsior and had other security plans in mind. Before we left, Pierre and Chelsea exchanged more French kisses, and I received a heartfelt hug and kisses from Pierre. We both teared up, still in shock from the day's events. Chelsea chattered nonstop on the way home, while I barely spoke, feeling overwhelmed by the changes. At home, I handled the kids' bath time while Chelsea was on the phone, excitedly recounting the weekend's events. As bedtime approached, she expressed her interest in making love, 
but I declined, citing jet lag and a busy day ahead. Chelsea was taken aback by my refusal and questioned if I was upset about Pierre staying with us. I voiced my frustration about not being consulted and hinted at my discomfort with how closely she seemed to bond with Pierre. Chelsea accused me of being jealous and irrational, but I countered with concerns about their upcoming week alone together. This led to a heated argument where Chelsea expressed her frustration and I responded with sarcasm. The next morning, I woke up feeling no inclination to apologize and quietly left for work. I assumed Chelsea would handle Pierre's arrival and wanted to focus on work to distract myself from the turmoil. Rachel arrived early and teased me about Pierre's influence on my professionalism. I explained that Pierre was coming to spend the week with me, as Chelsea had invited him. I also expressed concern about Chelsea being alone with him while I worked. Rachel noted that Pierre had been prominent in the news with Chelsea, but not much about me. She revealed that Pierre craved publicity and, while I let Chelsea handle that, she warned me about his reputation. According to Rachel, Pierre was a known playboy with a history of infidelity, particularly with married women. I appreciated the warning and acknowledged the possibility that Pierre might pursue Chelsea. I planned to discuss his behavior with her that evening to ensure she was aware. Working with occupational therapy clients helped distract me from negative thoughts. I had mixed feelings about Pierre, but I was eager for answers about our backgrounds. Arriving home later than usual, I was surprised to find three security contractor trucks at my house. Inside, Pierre was directing Roland, the foreman, on the installation of a new security system. Chelsea greeted me and explained that Pierre had arranged the security system as a gift for allowing him to stay the week. She had tried to get him to discuss it with me first, but he insisted on proceeding without prior notice. I questioned why I hadn't been informed about the changes. Chelsea explained it was a gift and wouldn't cost us anything. However, I felt my peace at home was being compromised and expressed frustration that such decisions were being made without my input. Chelsea insisted that accepting the gift graciously was the right approach and urged me to take a shower while she prepared supper. I left Chelsea and Pierre to their tasks and took a long, relaxing shower, hoping to lift my spirits. After some deep breathing, I joined my family at the dinner table, where I usually sit at the head, but now found Pierre taking that spot as our special guest. Chelsea had arranged French cuisine, escargot, vichy soise, and beurf bourguignon, along with fish sticks for the kids, who weren't keen on the adult dishes. I asked about the kids' meal and was told there were no more fish sticks. With Chelsea encouraging us all to try something new, I ignored the French dishes and made myself two peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. The kids quickly followed suit, asking for the same. I laughed, finding my inner child as I handed out sandwiches to my kids and made more for myself. Chelsea's discomfort was apparent, but I wasn't trying to impress Pierre, and I doubted Chelsea genuinely enjoyed the French dishes she pretended to like. When the doorbell rang, Helena dropped off some papers for Pierre to sign and a manila envelope containing information about our origins. She then left in the Excelsior limo. Pierre reviewed the documents and shared their contents. Our wealthy parents' names were redacted, and their identity remained unknown. The report revealed that our mother, known only as Pauline, had given birth to us, but her husband discovered he couldn't be our biological father. Pauline refused to name our real father, fearing her husband's retribution in response. He arranged for us to be adopted separately, and Pauline was allowed only to name us. I was born at 7.45 p.m., and Pierre was born three minutes later. Pierre was overwhelmed with emotion, crying on my shoulder as we grappled with the revelation of our origins. We learned that our mother was named Pauline, but we would never know our biological father. Despite her actions, it was clear she loved him deeply. This shared history seemed to bond Pierre and me more closely. We talked late into the night. Pierre apologized for the unapproved security system installation, assuring me it was an excellent safeguard for the family and would also protect him from paparazzi. He insisted the cost was irrelevant since family comes first. The installation would be finished the next day. I thanked him, though I was still irked. Chelsea had left us alone, understanding the need for our conversation. Later, as I got into bed, 
I tapped Chelsea's shoulder to discuss something important. She was annoyed and thought it was about intimacy, but I needed to share concerns Rachel had raised about Pierre. Rachel's research revealed Pierre's history of infidelity and his admitted attraction to married women. Despite my warnings, Chelsea dismissed my concerns, saying Pierre was a gentleman and urging me to sleep instead. Her dismissal left me frustrated, but I decided to let it go, as Rachel hadn't mentioned any direct evidence of Pierre's misbehavior. When I got home Tuesday evening, Chelsea filled me in on the day's events. Pierre had gone grocery shopping with her, enjoying the chance to impersonate me and be mistaken for me. He relished the anonymity, and the kids loved having two identical daddies. However, the security system was still incomplete due to a backordered part, which Roland promised to deliver as soon as it arrived. Despite his disappointment, Pierre took us out to the Excelsior Hotel for dinner, where I could enjoy something other than snails. At the hotel, there was a dance club we hadn't visited before. Chelsea danced the first two dances with me but then danced with Pierre for the rest of the evening. Helena, who joined us, invited me to dance, but I declined. I used the opportunity to chat with her. Helena, originally from Spain and now living in France, revealed she did various jobs for Pierre. She admitted to being essentially a high-paid personal assistant available 24-7. Despite her profession, she seemed content with her role and the luxury it afforded her. I told her I found her fascinating, which she found amusing and unusual. That night, as Chelsea and I prepared for bed, she was unusually persistent and aggressive, leaving me wondering about her thoughts. The next evening, Chelsea acted strangely, avoiding eye contact and being overly attentive, while Pierre seemed oddly satisfied. He shared stories about his childhood, his wealth, and suggested we work together on TV or movies. He even proposed moving my family to France, covering all expenses, but I had no intention of accepting. Later in bed, Chelsea was clearly uninterested in closeness, hinting at a surprise from Pierre that she was excited about. I was concerned about what the surprise might be, given the recent expensive security system. I hugged my kids as usual before heading to work, finding comfort in the routine and fulfillment in my job despite the day's normal pressures. Normally, I was apprehensive about facing the chaos at home when I arrived, but today was different. When I arrived home, I noticed a fancy blue sports car parked outside, likely a guest of Pierre's. The kids greeted me warmly, which helped me stay grounded. Inside, I was taken aback to see Chelsea in an elegant black dress and Pierre in a tuxedo. Pierre had arranged for a new tuxedo for me, but it didn't fit, so I wore one of my regular suits instead. Chelsea explained that the sitter was arriving soon, and Pierre wanted to take us out to celebrate. When I came downstairs in my suit, Pierre was visibly frustrated about the tuxedo but assured me it was fine. He then revealed that the sports car outside was a brand new French-made Venturi fetish, a gift for me. The car was an August Lie model, a French counterpart to the Tesla, and was now mine, with the title already in my name. The surprise Chelsea and Pierre had kept for me was overwhelming. The sports car alone seemed to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. I tried to refuse, feeling it was too much, but Pierre insisted it was a token of his deep affection. He also handed me a manila envelope containing mortgage papers for my house. I had only made one payment on my $950,000 home loan, but the paper showed the mortgage was paid in full. I was stunned and lightheaded as the magnitude of the gift sank in. Chelsea, equally emotional, praised Pierre's generosity. The magnitude of his gestures left both of us in tears of joy. Though overwhelmed, I couldn't deny the happiness and gratitude I felt. Pierre suggested we not miss our reservations and promised to discuss another matter during dinner. In the limo, I admire the Venturi fetish, still in awe of the generous gifts. As Pierre, Helena, and Gerald spoke rapidly in French, I remained captivated by the evening's surprises, feeling a mix of gratitude and guilt for my initial reluctance. During the ride, while Pierre, Helena, and Gerald chatted in French, I discreetly checked the value of the Venturi fetish sports car on my cell phone. The few available in America were priced around $425,000, but 
making Pierre's combined gifts worth approximately $1,375,000. The magnitude of his generosity was humbling. We arrived at an exclusive restaurant where I chose a steak dish from a menu I couldn't fully understand. Pierre, who ordered for Chelsea, later expressed his gratitude for the hospitality we'd shown him. He invited us to join him in France for a week, ideally too, to explore the country and deepen our bond. Despite his work commitments during the day, his evenings would be free for us to enjoy together. He asked me to check with work about taking the time off. Chelsea supported the idea, pointing out that I had an used vacation time that would be perfect for this trip. I have two weeks of vacation time available, but I wanted to discuss the trip with Chelsea before making any decisions. She's already keen on going, and after Pierre's incredible generosity, I felt I had no choice but to accept his offer. I was also eager to get to know my brother better, as he seems even more remarkable than I initially thought. I assured Pierre we'd love to accept his invitation and that I would request the time off from work. However, Pierre pointed out a potential issue, our children don't have passports, which cannot be expedited. He offered to have Helena stay behind to care for them if necessary, at his expense. Although I was reluctant to leave them, it was a great opportunity for Chelsea and me. Chelsea agreed with the plan, and Helena promised to care for the kids with dedication. Pierre was thrilled and said he'd arrange our flight as soon as he heard back from me. Chelsea's excitement matched his, and I felt a mix of anticipation and guilt about leaving the children behind. Greg Dixon, managing partner of New Directions Incorporated and a friend, initially approved my vacation leave but had to cancel due to Carl Reed and Francine Walsh both taking FMLA leave, which left us short-staffed. He offered to reschedule my vacation to start the following Tuesday giving me the full two weeks I'd planned but insisted I work Monday to avoid compromising patient care. I was frustrated, especially since Chelsea and I were set to fly to France the next morning. Greg suggested explaining the situation to Chelsea and seeing if the flights could be adjusted. Upon hearing the news, Chelsea was upset but agreed to try changing our departure to Tuesday. I proposed that Pierre, Helena, and Gerald go ahead with the brother plans while Chelsea and I would catch up with them later in the week. Chelsea was disappointed by the change in plans, as she had everything packed for our trip. She suggested that she, Pierre, and Gerald go ahead to France while I stay behind and join them on Tuesday. Helena would stay with the kids over the weekend so I wouldn't be alone. I agreed, seeing the benefit of a couple of extra days to test out my new car. On Saturday morning, I saw Chelsea, Pierre, and Gerald at the airport. The kids were disappointed not to be going to France but were reassured that passports would be arranged for the next time. I decided to handle the kids' needs myself until Monday morning. Despite Helena's insistence on staying to help, I assumed Pierre might have directed her to stay with us. With Helena gone, I resumed single dad duties. Amber took on a role of helping with her siblings while I realized I wouldn't be able to enjoy my new Vision sports car, so I parked it in the garage, replacing it with my regular Chevy Tahoe. I then settled into the den with the kids, who were engrossed in their latest favorite animated movie. On Saturday afternoon, after lunch with the kids, I answered the door to Roland from the security company. He explained that a key component had arrived early, allowing him to complete the installation sooner than expected. He set up the security key on my office computer, which would allow me access to our secure cloud servers. This key ensured that only I could access my video log files with no ability to delete records directly from the cloud. Roland demonstrated how to access the files, showing real-time monitoring and past recorded events. He showed a few random files, including one of a private moment between Chelsea and me. He reassured me that this was common and that cameras could be disabled for specific periods to avoid such recordings. He also explained that I could download and save archived files by right-clicking on the playback screen and selecting Save As. The files would be protected from tampering and could be used for personal records or legal protection. Roland finished up, and after a handshake, he left in his truck. I sat down in shock, trying to process the revelation that the recording of Chelsea and Pierre having closeness wasn't from our master bedroom but from the spare room. While I was at work, Rachel's premonition had come true. 
the brief clip didn't provide the full story, so. I prioritized downloading and scanning all footage from before their trip to France. Pierre had misunderstood the security system status, thinking it wasn't functioning properly. Realizing my hard disk couldn't hold all the files, I quickly scanned for any footage with Chelsea and Pierre together, noting file names, dates, and timestamps. Chelsea texted me from Paris, excited about the nightlights and asking about Helena. I lied about Helena's whereabouts, saying I didn't need her help until Monday and that the kids were napping. Chelsea, eager and distracted, didn't notice my lack of affection in my responses. I was concerned about Pierre's potential disappointment with Helena, questioning why he would be upset when I had sent her away. I took the kids to Costco, where I bought two 5 terabytes external hard drives on sale. We browsed the toy aisle, and I let each child pick one toy, which made them happy. We stopped at McDonald's on the way home, where they played energetically in the playground and enjoyed fries and milkshakes. Back home, I spent the rest of the day scanning log files and ordered pizza for dinner, which the kids devoured. After putting them to bed, I tackled downloading the 26 important files onto the new drives, which filled up quickly due to their high-definition format. I finally fell asleep around 2 a.m. and was woken at 7 a.m. by my hungry children eager for flapjacks. Despite the mess and lack of sleep, I didn't mind. After cleaning up, I answered the phone to Chelsea's excited call from France. I handed the phone to Amber, who spoke with Chelsea for a few minutes. Amber's comment about Chelsea not spending the night and that daddy's watching us by himself made me suspicious. I had Amber pass the phone to Neil and Rhonda, then turned it off when Rhonda said goodbye, hoping Chelsea would think the call ended accidentally. After 15 minutes, I turned the phone back on, and it rang immediately, but not from Chelsea. It was my sister Anita, who asked about my twin brother's situation. I broke down and told her Chelsea was cheating on me with Pierre. Anita was shocked, but quickly offered help. She and Darren were taking their kids to the water park and suggested picking up my kids for the day. I initially hesitated but accepted when Anita assured me that their parents would help. It was a huge relief, giving me time to sift through the recordings and prepare for a confrontation. Knowing Pierre's wealth made the situation delicate, Anita and I shared a deeply emotional hug as she took my kids for the day. I started by disabling the office camera, where I'd be working, with no concern about others overhearing. I turned up the audio to catch every detail. I focused on understanding Chelsea's seduction and their conversations about me. What I discovered was shocking. Chelsea, who seemed to be a gold digger, was flattered by Pierre's attention. She giggled at his accent, blushed at his comments, and accepted his gifts, which she hadn't shown me. Their interactions escalated from kisses to full-blown intimacy. It was unsettling watching them together, especially with my twin. The only difference was Pierre's voice. On Tuesday, they heavily kissed but hadn't had closeness yet, as Chelsea had been with me. By Wednesday, Pierre and Chelsea spent hours in his spare bedroom. Her guilt was evident as she avoided contact with me and kept the kids occupied with Frozen on Thursday and Friday. While I was at work, Pierre continued his affair with Chelsea in our bed. It was disturbing to see her apply the skills I taught her on him and witness his reactions. This confirmed that I could never be intimate with Chelsea again. The fallout for the kids was inevitable, but divorce was unavoidable. I needed to proceed cautiously due to Pierre's wealth. Listening to their conversation solidified my decision. Pierre believed money could buy anything, including me. After their lovemaking session on Wednesday afternoon, they discussed how to handle me. Pierre didn't want me to find out about their affair and hoped to avoid causing me emotional pain. He asked Chelsea if she could remain married to me while being with him whenever possible. Chelsea admitted she loved him but still had feelings for me, however, she was captivated by Pierre in a way she said I could never understand. Pierre expressed guilt over taking Chelsea from me and planned to compensate me. He intended to give me a high-end French sports car and pay off the mortgage on our new house, which Chelsea had purchased just over a month ago. He hoped these gifts would keep me off balance and endear him to me. That explained the car and the mortgage. Despite feeling guilty, Pierre continued his affair with Chelsea. 
she might be worth $1,375,000 to him, but to me, she's just worthless. Another conversation from the doorbell camera revealed Pierre's plan to have Chelsea persuade me to join him in France for a vacation. Pierre wanted time alone with Chelsea before I joined them, manipulating my work schedule to achieve this. Pierre arranged for Carl Reed and Francine Walsh to take FMLA leave, forcing Greg to make me work Monday and delaying my flight until Tuesday. It seemed Pierre had Helena Moreno, his assistant, handle these arrangements. Despite Pierre's attempts to placate me with gifts, his deceit and betrayal were clear. At 2.30 in the afternoon, Helena arrived at my door dressed to impress. Instead of inviting her in, I met her on the front porch. Helena arrived provocatively dressed and claimed she had something important to show me, asking to come inside. I refused, uncomfortable with her attire and our private setting. Helena insisted on a connection between us and asked to be let in. I confronted her with the fact that Pierre's security had activated my system and that he likely wanted her to seduce me with the evidence captured. Helena seemed taken aback but maintained her composure. She then asked to take a walk with me, promising no harm. I agreed, locked the front door, and we started walking. She made a few clicks on her phone and slipped it into her purse. An Uber arrived, and Helena suggested we go somewhere private to talk. Helena and I went to the local mall and settled in the food court with our snacks. She confirmed my suspicions, revealing that Pierre had planned to seduce me and use it as leverage against me to justify his own affair with Chelsea. Helena explained that Pierre believed by making me unfaithful, I would be less likely to complain about Chelsea's betrayal. Despite her loyalty to Pierre, Helena admitted that she disagreed with his actions, especially given that my marriage and family were involved. She felt a moral obligation to be honest with me, unlike in previous cases where the husbands were less innocent. Helena mentioned that Pierre believed his gifts, a sports car and mortgage payoff, would placate me, underestimating the impact of his betrayal. I reassured her that I already had clear high-definition evidence of Pierre's and Chelsea's betrayal, thanks to my security system. Helena seemed relieved to know that I had the proof needed to confront them. Helena was shocked when I revealed I had concrete evidence of Pierre's affairs, something no one else had ever managed. She warned that this evidence could make me a serious threat to Pierre, who currently doesn't know about it. Helena explained that Pierre sees his affair with Chelsea as a minor issue, expecting it to be a temporary bump in the road. He believes in maintaining a close relationship with me, his only brother, and expects us to eventually reconcile. I told Helena that Pierre was dead to me and that I was determined to divorce Chelsea. Helena was concerned that my actions would devastate Pierre, as he has never cared so much about anyone other than himself. She warned that Pierre could retaliate with his vast resources if he felt threatened. Helena expressed her own dilemma, noting that if Pierre learned she had helped me, it could end her career and put her at risk. She acknowledged the potential danger of Pierre's resources and violence but admired my integrity and strength. I asked Helena about a conversation in French she and Pierre had on Thursday, which she had previously been reluctant to discuss. Helena was shocked to learn I had evidence of Pierre's affairs, something no one else had ever gathered. She revealed that Pierre was bragging about his conquest of Chelsea, disregarding the impact on me. Pierre had instructed Helena to seduce me as part of his plan and even chose her outfit for the occasion. Helena admitted that taking other men's wives was a power trip for Pierre. Helena was conflicted, feeling like she had been compromising her values working for Pierre. She was ready to separate from him but needed to coordinate timing with me to avoid suspicion. We decided to use prepaid cell phones for secure communication since my house was bugged. Helena suggested staging a scene where she seduces me and I reject her to mislead Pierre and buy us time. I agreed with her plan and was impressed by her resourcefulness. She also offered to help cover for me at work if needed, as she had arranged for two therapists to be off work that evening. Helena spent over an hour flirting. When she tried to kiss me, I turned my face so she kissed my cheek instead. I complimented her, praised her beauty and reaffirmed my commitment to my wife. I asked her to return at 7.30 a.m. to watch the children while I was at work. Helena Coy responded with maybe next time for the camera and then left soon after. 
Amber, Neil, and Rhonda arrived exhausted. I thanked Anita for her help and got the kids to bed without a bath. I spent my spare moments searching for new apartments, aiming to leave the house tainted by betrayal and funded by my twin brother. Greg agreed to cover for me and instructed the office secretary to forward all calls about me directly to him without comment. On Monday evening, the children excitedly greeted me, saying Aunt Helena had ordered pizza and was preparing a chicken casserole. I was surprised by Helena's domestic role. When I returned from showering, the table was set, and Helena served a large portion of casserole onto my plate. She mentioned it was her mother's recipe and watched as I tasted it. I praised her cooking, saying it changed my view of French cuisine. Helena appreciated the compliment. That evening, after the kids were bathed and in bed, Helena read them a bedtime story, captivating them with her melodious voice. I watched from the doorway, impressed by this unexpected side of her. Later, we watched TV together, and Helena continued to flirt and tease, pressing her body close to me. Despite her advances, I politely declined and sent her on her way. On Tuesday morning, I pretended to leave for work and drove off. Helena then loaded the kids into Chelsea's car and met me a block away. We dropped the kids at a daycare for busy parents and went apartment hunting. Helena was surprised by my prearranged phone call and was glad for the change. We visited the three apartments I had shortlisted, and I asked for her advice before signing a lease. After lunch, I rented a storage unit. At 3 p.m., my cell phone rang with Chelsea's call. I fed her a story and explained that my vacation was cancelled and I might not make it to France this week. Chelsea seemed perplexed but accepted my excuse. Shortly after, Helena's phone rang, and I quietly listened as she spoke rapidly in French. It was Pierre, who was clearly upset. He had Chelsea call my boss, who fabricated a coronavirus issue to cancel my vacation. Pierre wanted Helena to improve her seduction techniques, as he felt my rejection was due to her insufficient effort. He expressed frustration with the situation and his desire to bond with me as his brother. Helena reassured him that we would manage this week and continue our plans for the future. After returning home, Helena turned off the circuit breaker for the security system and confirmed the cameras were inactive. We loaded both cars with my tools and equipment and transported everything to the storage facility. Helena picked up the kids and was back before I got home, ensuring they could truthfully say I went to work as usual. The security system was restored, and Pierre wouldn't expect recordings during the downtime. That night, Helena performed a strip tease for me, but I had tightened my belt to prevent any further advances. I sent her away after loudly declaring my commitment to my wife, all to frustrate Chelsea and Pierre. Over Wednesday and Thursday, I moved my belongings to the storage facility or the new apartment. On Friday, we moved the kids' items into the apartment, leaving some at the old house to avoid questions. Chelsea called each evening, but I only let the kids speak to her, frustrating her further. I had the utilities disconnected from the house and arranged for a controlled burn with the fire department as a training exercise. I doused the cars and house with gasoline, and after the final move, I ignited the fire. The structure collapsed quickly, with only the gas tank explosions causing excitement, which the fire department managed expertly. I filed for a permit to demolish the house and remove debris, including proof of no outstanding mortgage. My explanation that I intended to rebuild a more energy-efficient home satisfied their climate change policies. In less than four hours, the property's value dropped from $1,375,000 to zero. By 9 p.m., the fire department confirmed no embers remained, and the demolition crew promised to clear the lot by Sunday night. I paid them up front. Despite possible criticism, I chose destruction over selling the property because I wanted nothing to do with the money linked to my past. The children adapted well to the new three-bedroom apartment, treating it like a fun adventure. The girls got the master bedroom, Neil took the smallest room and I moved into a mid-sized room with some old furniture and a new bed. I informed my parents and sister about the move but kept Chelsea's parents unaware for now. Helena was glad that after the Friday move, no more stage performances would occur. 
I slept on the couch Friday and Saturday nights, encouraging Helena to stay in my bedroom, which the kids enjoyed. My phone was off to prevent Chelsea from learning about the move. Helena arranged for a news conference in Hollywood on Sunday using her frequent flyer miles. My parents would visit the new apartment to spend time with the grandchildren on Saturday. Pierre called Helena about the offline security system. She claimed ignorance and reported her failed seduction attempts. Pierre suggested hiring an escort, but Chelsea disagreed, believing I needed more time. Pierre was frustrated and instructed Helena to record her next attempt. If successful, Pierre would shift the conversation to my work schedule. Helena mentioned that she was in daily contact with Greg, my boss, who hoped that at least one or two of the employees out with coronavirus would return on Monday, though there were no guarantees. She promised to arrange my ticket to France once I was released from work. Helena, while lying to Pierre about her disdain for babysitting my children to show her disinterest, confirmed that she also disliked kids and regretted not bringing me initially. He transferred a €300,000 bonus to Helena and promised an additional €700,000 for explicit video of our encounters. Helena shared this with me, so I trusted her. I chose to confront them via our planned press announcement rather than directly. I avoided Chelsea and turned off my phone to prevent the children from mentioning our new place. Pierre called Helena expressing concern about my phone and pressing her to get me off work so I could travel. My parents arrived at the new apartment at 7 a.m. to care for the children. Helena and I flew to California, arriving two hours before our noon press conference in Hollywood. There were fewer reporters than at Pierre's previous event, but I was confident the story would spread. At the press conference, I introduced myself as Paul Block, Pierre Dumont's identical twin, and announced my intention to divorce Chelsea due to their betrayal. I declared that I was severing all ties with Pierre. Laughter broke out among the reporters when one questioned why Pierre, who had gifted me a new French sports car and paid off my mortgage, would act harmfully towards me. I explained that Pierre's gifts were meant to compensate for his intrusion into my marriage, but they were short-lived. Two days ago, my house and the new sports car, which I hadn't driven, were burned to the ground. Both were total losses and without insurance since I had cancelled it when Pierre paid off the mortgage. The financial hit was even greater than just the value of his gifts. I also lost a $100,000 down payment on the house. Some journalists snickered, questioning if I was trying to extract more money from Pierre. I clarified that I wanted nothing more from him and wished him to stay away from me and my family. I handed out memory chips containing raw footage of Pierre and Chelsea's trysts, urging them to verify my claims and see photos of my wife with Pierre in France. When asked about our current situation, I said we had moved into an affordable three-bedroom apartment and were adjusting to life as a single father without Chelsea. The group fell silent, realizing the possibility that my claims might be true. They could easily verify the details, and the stories would spread, potentially damaging Pierre's reputation in France, where image is crucial. I braced myself for the inevitable fallout. After the press conference, Helena and I had lunch at a restaurant. Helena expressed how difficult it was for her to leave, revealing her genuine affection for the children. I reassured her that she was more than a babysitter to them. She handed me a document to sign, claiming it would protect us from potential retaliation by Pierre. I signed without question and asked if she was sure about leaving Pierre's employ. She confirmed, explaining that her connections and presence at the conference would make her a target as well. Helena shared that she planned to stay with a former college friend at the French Honorary Consulate in Georgetown, Cayman Islands, to ensure her safety. She promised that our paths would cross again when things settled. I gave her my prepaid phone for security and shared a passionate kiss before we parted ways at the airport. Returning home, I enjoyed a comforting dinner but the weight of what was to come still loomed large. I waited to see when the news would hit the French social scene, but Chelsea seemed unaware when she called. I decided to confront her and recorded the call for accuracy. I began by telling Chelsea that I knew everything about her affair with my twin brother. I explained that I had video evidence of their encounters in our home, captured by the security system Pierre had installed. Chelsea was shocked and apologized, 
claiming she didn't intend to fall for Pierre but was drawn to him as a better version of me. She said Pierre was uncomfortable around children and that she planned to take a leave of absence from our marriage to travel with him, promising to return later. I informed her that our house and Pierre's sports car had burned down, with no insurance coverage for the losses. I noted her lack of concern for the children's well-being, which was telling. Chelsea expressed disbelief about the fire and the lack of insurance coverage, but I told her that all personal belongings were lost and our marriage was over. Chelsea insisted Pierre wouldn't let me divorce her, but I clarified that I would be filing for abandonment and full custody of the children. I ended the call by stating that Chelsea and Pierre had no place in my life and instructed her not to call again. I turned off my phone and decided to change my number. I anticipated that once the news hit France, Pierre would urgently try to contact Helena for damage control. Her unavailability would likely infuriate him, leading him to possibly send someone else or even return himself to handle the situation. I changed my phone number early Monday morning, making it unreachable for Pierre. However, he still managed to call me at work, prompting an urgent call to my desk. Pierre pleaded with me to recant my statements, accusing me of destroying his reputation and disrupting my family for a trivial reason. I replied that Helena meant everything to me, and I was simply returning the favor for his betrayal. Pierre insulted me, calling me a loser, which I brushed off before ending the call and requesting that my company block his calls. I spent my free moments checking online for updates on the fallout from my press conference. Blurred video snippets were circulating on social media, with initial denials from Pierre quickly contradicted by recognizable voice and accent. Paparazzi shots of Pierre and Chelsea were being republished as confirmation of my story. Entertainment journalists attempted to interview Chelsea, but Pierre ordered her to ignore them. Despite completing his movie scenes, Pierre was informed that he would be replaced due to the controversy. As they tried to travel, the press relentlessly harassed them, transforming Pierre from a celebrated star to a notorious predator in just two weeks. Pierre faced an avalanche of similar accusations from other victims, leading to the suspension of all his talent contracts and public disdain. His career was in ruins, and Chelsea was enduring harsh treatment from him, likely due to his anger at my revelations. Unable to restore his image, Pierre replaced Helena, who had gone missing, and sought revenge against me. He secretly bought New Directions Incorporated for $20 million through a shell company, resulting in the termination of my position and the installation of Brad Preston as the new CEO. Preston, acting on Pierre's orders, falsified my personnel record to include false claims of inappropriate conduct, aiming to damage my reputation. He also made sure that any calls about me were redirected to his office. Preston was tasked with finding Helena and was monitoring me for any leads. Meanwhile, Pierre hired a hacker to locate and transfer all my financial assets offshore, leaving me with nothing but my bills. My bank accounts, 401k, and investments were all drained, leaving me without income and struggling to manage monthly expenses. Pierre had grown tired of Chelsea and was disappointed that he couldn't humiliate his brother as he had hoped. She had become a liability in his public life, and any sightings of them together had been negative. He gave her a half-hearted apology, blamed her husband, and sent her back to the U.S., allowing her to keep the gifts he gave her. Once back, Chelsea immediately sought me out using the new address Pierre provided. She asked to see our children and hoped to reconcile. I told her it was too late, I had already filed for divorce due to her abandonment. Despite her claims that she realized the value of our relationship, I made it clear that her actions had ended our marriage, and she needed to leave. If a court mandates visitation, I would comply, but until then, she was not welcome. Chelsea asked if she could stay, offering to cook, clean, and provide affection. I told her she was no longer relevant to me or the kids. She then revealed she was pregnant and claimed I was the father, showing me DNA results but I knew it was impossible since we hadn't been intimate since before she left the country. I refused to take responsibility for the child and told her she couldn't stay. I suggested she contact her parents for help and made it clear that anything she left behind would be discarded. She left sobbing, and her parents arrived to take her away. I didn't mention my unemployment. 
my friends and family were stunned by my dire situation. I'd lost my house, car, job, and discovered all my financial accounts were hacked, leaving me broke. The next day, I received notice of an investigation into inappropriate behavior at my former job, which could cost me my professional credentials. I suspected Pierre was behind it but had no proof. Reflecting on my situation, I regretted not securing my finances better. I faced mounting bills and found out my bank wouldn't replace the stolen funds until I proved otherwise. My parents couldn't support us, and I was hesitant to burden my sister. Despite promising interviews, I was rejected from every job. Chelsea, having pawned Pierre's jewelry, hired an attorney for her divorce and visitation rights. She served me with a summons for an arbitration meeting. The meeting was unproductive, we disagreed on everything, and a follow-up was scheduled in two weeks. A week later, Chelsea called me from jail, pleading for help. She had no one else and begged me to come to the police station. I agreed to arrange for someone to watch the kids and see what I could do when I arrived at the station for a face-to-face -face visit. Chelsea looked devastated. We spoke through a glass partition. Why are you here, Chelsea? I asked, concerned. Thank you for coming, Paul. I never wanted you to find out, she said, visibly shaking. Pierre was an a-hole, and I was blinded by his wealth. After our last call, I lost control. Pierre gave me Xanax, then oxycodone. I became obsessed and needed more to function. I pawned the jewelry he gave me to pay my lawyer. When I ran out of pills, I had to exchange closeness for pills. I was arrested for this, and I'm stuck here with a $250 bail I can't afford. My parents will kick me out if I ask them for help. Please don't let that happen. Despite my anger at her recent actions, I felt compassion but had no money myself. I couldn't even support my children, so helping her seemed impossible. Chelsea and I were both broke. Pierre had not only gotten me fired but also had a hacker steal all my financial assets. The only way I could raise the $250 bail was by getting a loan against my car, but I needed Chelsea's agreement on primary custody of the kids and visitation rights for her every other weekend. After some negotiation, Chelsea agreed to the terms. I arranged for my parents to take the kids camping for the weekend to give me space to sort things out. I decided not to inform them about Chelsea's situation yet. That night at a July 4th celebration, two well-dressed men took the stage, one carrying an aluminum bat. They announced they were looking for me to teach me a lesson for alleged misconduct. As they scanned the crowd and made their way toward me, I felt a sense of dread. Just before they reached me, an eight-year-old girl in a wheelchair suddenly positioned herself between us, and the crowd fell silent. In the crowd of 2000, the eight-year-old girl defended me, stating I had shown her kindness and patience during my time of need. Her mother then stepped in, threatening any harm against her daughter. Her husband also joined in, warning the attackers to stay away. As the situation escalated, five muscular men and their wives stepped forward, showing their support for me. The entire town eventually stood in my defense, inspired by the courage of the young girl. Greg Dixon, standing near the mayor, vouched for my character, explaining my good reputation and unjust firing. The mayor then addressed the crowd, asking if anyone had ever been abused by me. Silence followed until one woman spoke up, praising my help during her mother's recovery and confirming my good character. As people shared their stories of my kindness and good work, the mayor acknowledged the unfairness I faced and called for support. He asked if anyone could offer me employment, and many hands were raised. The mayor also instructed the police to detain the attackers and increase patrols near my home, assuring me of the town's support. Moved by the overwhelming kindness, I thanked everyone as the crowd parted to let me through. Feeling reluctant to return to my empty apartment, I drove to the lake to watch the fireworks. While sitting by the shore, I discovered what seemed to be a valuable diamond ring. I took it to the town's largest jewelry store, where the manager quickly recognized it and went to verify its worth. The jeweler confirmed that the diamond ring I found was worth $150,000, though its custom price was $150,000. I agreed to sell it for $150,000, 
with $1,200 in cash and a check for $148,800. After finalizing the deal, I bailed Chelsea out of jail and arranged a taxi for her to her parents' home. I then went grocery shopping to restock my empty pantry. As I carried the groceries to my apartment, everything suddenly went black. I slowly regained consciousness in a hospital room, greeted by a smiling Helena. Disoriented, I wondered if I had died. Helena called for the doctor, who quickly examined me. He informed me that I had been in a medically induced coma for three days due to severe head trauma and swelling. Helena explained that she had identified herself as my wife to ensure she could stay by my side and that. I was covered under her company's health insurance, which I had unknowingly signed up for. I was deeply grateful and wished I had known her sooner. Helena reassured me that my children were safe with my family and that she had been taking care of them when not at the hospital. She then offered to show me a video from the night of my attack. The video showed me walking home with groceries when a thug hit me from behind with a baseball bat, knocking me out. Two men stood over me, and one raised the bat for another blow. Suddenly, Gerald appeared, deflecting the bat and confronting the attackers. He fought off the man with the bat, who fell to the ground, and the police arrived within minutes after Gerald's call. Helena explained that Gerald had left Pierre's employ after learning of the plot against me and had come to protect us both. He stands guard outside my hospital room while Helena visits. The audio was disabled in the video to protect Gerald's identity and ensure the evidence showed him acting in self-defense. Gerald had threatened the surviving attacker to confess and testify against Pierre, and then performed a life-saving tracheotomy on the injured man with a pen and pocket knife. I was stunned as I took in Helena's words. She explained that her presence here wasn't for nothing. Henry, a close friend from college who is now in Georgetown, offered her safety from Pierre despite his charm and the affection she once had for him. Henry is gay, and their bond was purely platonic. During her stay with Henry and his husband, Franco, Helena learned about true love, something she had struggled with due to her painful childhood, her parents' bitter divorce, and their manipulation, which left her distrusting of love and marriage. Henry and Franco's relationship showed her what genuine love looked like, something she had never experienced before. Helena had used men superficially, but Henry's teachings helped her understand that love is a gift, not a duty. Franco's suggestion helped clarify this concept for her. Helena continued explaining that Franco and Henry had rented the movie Moulin Rouge for her. Despite knowing the history, she had never seen the film before. As they watched it together, Franco said that if she didn't understand love after seeing the movie, there was little hope for her. For Helena, the film was transformative, its depiction of love deeply affected her, particularly the song Come What May, which made the concept of love tangible for her. Henry's profound statement, You will never know love unless you surrender to it, struck her deeply. With tears streaming down her face, Helena confessed her love for me, something she hadn't done since childhood. She revealed that she had mistaken me for someone like Pierre but realized I was different, pure of heart and genuinely caring. She saw the love in me that she had never recognized before. As Helena cried on my chest, I felt a warmth and love I hadn't experienced in a long time. Overwhelmed, I took her hand and asked her to marry me once my divorce from Chelsea was finalized. She hugged me tightly, expressing her joy with enthusiastic agreement. I reminded her that exclusivity was crucial for me, and she assured me that she was committed to a monogamous relationship. When I was able to return home, Helena stayed with me, sleeping on the couch while I used the bed. Gerald left after receiving my thanks and an offer of payment, which he declined with a chuckle. At the arbitration meeting, Chelsea and I finalized our custody agreement, and the attorney promised to get it confirmed by a judge quickly. We scheduled another meeting to discuss the divorce. Afterward, I invited Chelsea for coffee to discuss a proposal. Over coffee and donuts, I asked how she was coping since her jail time. She admitted struggling with cravings and still occasionally visiting her dealer. I offered her a lifeline, a rehab program that cost 20 grand, which I would sponsor if she agreed to sign the uncontested divorce papers. I promised an additional 10 grand if she completed the program and got a clean bill of health. 
I explained that I intended to marry Helena if she would have me. Chelsea pondered my offer and then asked for one final request, a passionate kiss for closure. She wanted to feel the passion we once shared, and in return, she would agree to my proposal. I saw a longing in Chelsea's eyes that had been missing for years. Considering her request and our current situation, I knew I couldn't marry Helena until the divorce was finalized, and fulfilling Chelsea's request might speed up the process. Despite my discomfort about her recent activities and potential health risks, I proposed a deal, I would give her a passionate kiss when Helena and I picked her up from rehab, marking a memorable moment for both of us. Chelsea agreed, and we shook on it. I knew that rehab included STD testing, so Chelsea would be clean by the time she completed the program. I planned to inform Helena of my promise and its reasoning to avoid any misunderstandings. Chelsea signed the divorce papers, and our divorce would be finalized in about eight months. To celebrate the signing, Helena and I. I took the kids out to eat, though we kept the real reason from them. The next day, we began house hunting to find a four-bedroom rental so Helena could have her own space away from the couch. We moved in within a week. Chelsea arranged her admission to the rehab center that same week. I drove her to the facility and paid the fee in cash. On the drive back, I called Chelsea's parents to let them know she was settled and to see if they could take their grandchildren for the weekend. They were pleased to help, and I told them we'd pick up the kids on Sunday afternoon. Helena looked at me with curiosity once the house was empty. With the divorce papers signed, I considered Chelsea and me already divorced, the final paperwork was just a formality. Helena, thrilled, celebrated by jumping into my arms as we eagerly undressed and made passionate love four times that first night. We spent the entire weekend together, only dressing when we had to pick up the kids. We maintained separate sleeping arrangements for the sake of the children but enjoyed our time together whenever they were away. Four months later, Helena and I arrived at the No Look Back Rehab Center. Helena held a large envelope of cash, and I greeted Chelsea, now visibly seven months pregnant, with a heartfelt kiss. Chelsea, grateful, apologized and praised me, advising Helena to cherish and hold on to me. Helena thanked Chelsea, and we drove her to her parents' house. Chelsea planned to use the money to get an apartment and start a secretarial job arranged by the rehab center. She also decided to put her baby up for adoption. After the divorce decree was finalized, Helena threw herself into planning our wedding in France. We had a magnificent ceremony at a cathedral, complete with a grand pipe organ. Helena's mother, who had invited many prominent guests, was deeply moved by her daughter's unwavering commitment to me despite the initial upheaval. They shared a heartfelt moment of reconciliation. In France, a class action lawsuit was filed against Pierre Dumont, with me among the 20 litigants, along with criminal charges for assault and attempted murder. Helena's trusted Parisian lawyer managed the criminal charges separately. We didn't attend the hearings or trial, as our presence might have drawn unwanted attention. After over a year of legal battles, Pierre was found guilty of destroying 20 marriages and was ordered to pay a total of 40 million euros, with 2 million euros awarded to each litigant. On the criminal charges, he was convicted of conspiracy to commit assault and murder. Thanks to Mr. Brass Knuckles' testimony, Pierre received a 20-year prison sentence, was ordered to pay me an additional 1 million euros, and to transfer ownership of the New Direction's occupational therapist business to me. Helena's lawyer proved to be exceptionally effective, and I was very pleased with the result. The medical review board cleared me of any wrongdoing, so I continued my role as CEO of New Directions, fulfilling my passion for helping others. Helena and I built our dream home and a second one next door for my parents, providing them with a mortgage-free residence. We also supported the college educations of Anita and Darren's children. Amber, Neil, and Rhonda gained two stepbrothers, completing our family. Helena remained loyal and trustworthy throughout. Five years after rehab, Chelsea married a colleague and maintained regular visitations with the children. We stayed on good terms, and Chelsea never spoke ill of me. I proudly walked Amber and Rhonda down the aisle at their weddings. As I grew older, I remained deeply grateful to the brave eight-year-old girl whose selfless intervention had profoundly changed my life.
her courage made a lasting impact on me.